This is the last video I'm going to do on velodromes. So the two other velodrome videos that I've done are the more basic. This kind of question, I'm almost certain that the question I'm going to ask in this particular video would never get asked in the exam. And it's simply because it relies on a bit of mathematics called simultaneous equations that students, if they haven't done further or methods, I'm not sure whether it's covered in further, if they haven't done further or methods, they will not be able to solve this question. But I think it's good to do this question because it shows that even when the physics gets really difficult, the maths, now I know this is counterintuitive to what I've just said, but the maths is actually quite simple. People who have done methods and done spec can easily solve simultaneous equations and I'm going to show how they're incorporated into a velodrome question. So basically, we have the same cyclist. We'll keep this as neat as possible. The mass of the cyclist and the bike is 60 kilograms. The radius of the path that he's tracing is 60 meters. He's moving, this is the key here, at a constant speed of 10 meters per second. And there is friction acting by the ground, no, by the wood of the sloped path on the cyclist parallel to the plane there. So there's this resistive force, which will actually do, do uh, in yellow. Resistive force there. Our goal is to find that resistive force. That is our goal. So what kind of resistive force do you need to keep a cyclist moving in a circle when there's a slope 30 degrees at 10 meters per second? It's more difficult than you might think. Let's draw in our force diagrams to start off with. We've got the frictional resistive force there, the weight force down here, 600 newtons, and the normal force acting perpendicular to the plane up there. Normal force. The net force points towards the center of the, of the path that he traces, the circle that he traces. And we can find that net force right now because we have M, V, and R which is all we need to solve for net force. So let's start off with that. The net force is equal to m times v squared, 10 squared over 60. That is 60 divided by 60 cancels down 100 newtons. So the net force acting towards the middle of that circle is 100 newtons. We talk about the components acting in the horizontal direction. Gravity has no component acting in the horizontal direction. The normal force does. It's this part here. And the resistive force does. It's that part there. So these two forces act in the horizontal direction. We'll fill in this angle here. That's 30 degrees. That angle there has to be the same as that angle there. Uh, and this angle down here is also 30 degrees. So, if we write down an equation for what we just stated, that this, uh, this horizontal component and this horizontal component have to add up to this horizontal component, we find that sine 30 degrees n, which is that, take away cos 30 degrees r, is equal to that net force there was 100. So that's equal to 100. We don't know R, what big R, the resistive force, and we don't know N. If we knew at least one of either R or N, we'd be able to solve for the other. But we don't. We've got this equation with two unknowns. First equation there. So we need a second equation. So we need a, a simultaneous equation in order to solve N and R. 
and we're going to make one out of these. The vertical forces have to sum to zero. Since the net force is purely horizontal, this vertical component, this vertical component, this vertical component have to sum to zero. That was covered in the velodrome friction lesson. What is the size of that component there? That would be cos 30 degrees n. What's the size of that vertical component there? That's sine 30 degrees r. And the size of that is 600. So our second simultaneous equation, I'll move that up. The second simultaneous equation is that cos 30 degrees n, so the force is acting in that direction there, plus sine 30 degrees r, that's another force acting in that direction, is equal to the force acting down there, 600. Again, we don't know r or n. If we knew one, we could solve the other here. But since we have these two beautiful equations, and we've got two unknowns, we can actually solve for the variables. Now, the first step I like to take is to take all the sine 30 and cos 30 and turn that into decimals. So sine 30 degrees is a half and cos 30 degrees is 0.866. So we'll rewrite them. Here's the first one. 0.5n, that's a half. Take away 0.866r is equal to 100. And the second one, 0.866n plus 0.5r is equal to 600. Now let's try in the first equation up here, so just this one focusing now, to get n by itself. So we have 0.5n, adding 0.866r to both sides, is equal to 100 plus 0.866r. So n is equal to 2 times, so multiple, I actually say divided by 0.5 to make this easy, 100 plus 0.866r divided by 0.5. Now we've got n by itself, and all that information came from the first equation. We haven't used the second equation yet. We're going to use the second equation right now. So we rewrite the second equation. But instead of putting n, we put this, because this is equivalent to n. So we have 0 0.866 times 100 plus 0.8. 66R divided by 0.5 is, oh, plus, so we've finished that part of the equation, plus 0.5R is equal to 600. Now we try to get r by itself. So we have 0.866 over 0 0.5 multiplied by 100 plus 0.866r plus 0.5r equals 600. Expanding this out, we get, well first of all we'll solve for that, 0.866 divided by 0.5 comes to 1.732. So we can rub this part out and just write 1.732. Now, if this is in brackets, what we can do is multiply that through that line there. So we get, instead of 1.732 times 100, we get 1.732 times 100, that's 173.2. And instead of plus 0.866R, 
it's 0.866R times 1.732, which comes to around 1.5R plus 1.5R. And now we can simply remove those brackets since they no longer have a factor out the front. And look at that, we've got two R terms. First of all, let's take 173.2 from both sides. So this term I'm just moving over there, plus 0.5R equals 600, take away 173.2, which is equal to 426.8. And then if we add those together, that's a total of 2R is equal to 426.8. So R is equal to 426.8 divided by 2, 213.4 newtons. So quite a bit of decimal work there. I'm just going to check. That seems like a common sense answer. There is a way to check that answer, which we'll actually do now. You feel free to stop the video now, but I'm going to go through how we can check that answer. So in the previous video, we actually started with R. And then we solved for N and then the centripetal speed. So we'll pretend we don't know the speed from now on. If we can get back to 10, we'll, we'll know we were, had a great answer. So first of all, let's find n. Sine 30 degrees times r plus cos 30 degrees n equals 600. So n is equal to 600 take away sine 30 degrees r over cos 30 degrees. 600 take 0.5 times 213.4 all over cos 30 degrees comes to 569.6 newtons. And then we had sine 30 degrees n, that force there, take away cos 30 degrees r is equal to the net centripetal force towards the middle. So 0 0.5 times n, which was 569, take away 0.866 times our r value. Now we're plugging it in, 213.4 is equal to, I'm very happy with this, 100. So I worked that out, it was 0 0.5 times uh, what, what, 5, 6, 9.6, take away 0.866 times 213.4, so relying on our answer here, and we did get a net centripetal force of 100. And that is the net centripetal force we had here. So just to cap it off, cap it off we had 100 is equal to mv squared on r, which is equal to 60 times v squared on 60, those cancel down. 100 equals v squared, v equals 10 meters per second. So I have great faith in my answer there, since I used it uh, to work backwards to find the original given speed.